All right. Um, okay, so um, Samit and I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. So yesterday, you were working on the Gillespie's algorithm, right? Um, how many people finished the problems? One, two, you might need a little bit more time. How many people need, need maybe another hour or, hour or two to work on it? Yeah, you can raise your hand, it's okay. Do you need another hour or two? Yeah, okay. I think what we'll do then is I'll, I'll make some copies of what we were planning to do this afternoon, okay? Um, but um, you, I, want, I think it's better if you finish what we were doing yesterday before, and then the people who finished, we have some more problems you can work on uh, in a somewhat different direction, okay? But I'd like you guys to finish the multi-type example with simulation, because if you can do this, it's a very powerful tool. If you want to simulate a branching process with more than one kind of thing, it's a very powerful tool to be able to simulate uh, using Gillespie. We use it all the time. Okay. Does that sound reasonable? So you basically assume that this afternoon, most, for most people, you'll start off working on the, uh, the continuing the problems from, from yesterday. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so today, the main tool we're going to study in the class is going to be the generating function. Okay, so let's get down to it and let's figure out what the generating function is and then we'll have some problems. Okay, okay so I'm just repeating the reasons why we use stochastic models. It's when we have small and rare events. Okay, small numbers and uh, rare events. Um, if you remember the viral blips, yeah, so you have a patient on stable treatment and they'll just occasionally show a blip and we don't really understand exactly why. Um, so now focusing back in on the birth-death process, this is the differential equation which would match the simple birth-death process. And like I said to you yesterday, this doesn't really have any stochastic element to it at all, right? So what we try to do is we try to replace the differential equation formulation with the explicit number formulation and we look at probability distributions on the numbers. Okay, so if you remember, we had 43210 cells, yeah? So we started off here and then with rate D, we would move here and with rate B, we would move, move to four, yeah? And um, we were trying to compute this thing P of N, N and N zero, okay? So that's the goal, right? Yeah, we were trying to compute that thing. And I had you guys on the second problem sheet, you were trying to compute for pure birth and pure death process, right? I don't remember quite how much headway you guys made, but I think we talked about it and you had an idea of what these P's kind of mean, yeah? Okay. All right. So, um, so again, just repeating what we did yesterday. So we, we have the probabilities. So you start at N0. What's the probability you're now at N at time T? Okay, and we derived by considering small length of time and then sending that length of time to zero, we derived the, form, the, the, the master equation for, for the system, right? So this is the rate of change of the probability that you're in N given that you started in N zero as a function of N, okay? Okay, so this is called the, the forward uh, equation and shortly we'll be seeing the backward equation. Okay, that's which I'll explain to you when we get to it, okay? But if you just remember what we did here, we started off with what can happen in some small unit of time, assuming that you don't get two things happening, yeah? So we were able to have a death, taking us from n plus one back to n. We were able to have a birth, taking us from n minus one up to n. And then we could do nothing and stay at n. Those were the ways that we could be at n a little bit later, yeah? Okay, and from that we went to this differential equation, taking the limit as the time went to zero. Yeah, and this is the master equation, the forward master equation, forward Kolmogorov equation. Okay, so how many how many differential equations are here? Infinitely many, right? This is a, this is an infinite system of differential equations. So it's inconvenient to solve. Yeah, <laughs> on the whole. So we had some tricks yesterday for the pure birth and the pure death problem, right? So we could solve some stuff. We could figure some things out, yeah? But on the whole, it's inconvenient to have to solve infinitely many system, uh, equations. We would prefer to solve uh, one equation, right? Or a small number at any rate, yeah? So 
what I'm going to do now is convert that infinite system of ODEs into a single PDE. All right, so that's, that's the goal now, is to convert that into a PDE. And to get there, I'm going to use a tool called the probability generating function. All right? Okay, so let's put this on the board. So the probability generating function is this, at first glance, it's weird. Okay, if you've ever done um, Fourier series, you can think of it kind of like a Fourier series. Okay, so we're expressing um, the function P, well, well we're, we're supposing that the P is kind of like the Fourier coefficients, and the Z is kind of like the sines and cosines. That's kind of the idea here. All right, so we're expanding a polynomial using the probabilities as the coefficients of the polynomial. Okay, so we write g of n0 t and z is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of p n n0 of t z to the n. Okay? All right. So this, this doesn't look like it's going to be helpful. Can we agree on that? I don't know. Does anyone feel good about doing this? Or well, you do, because you've seen it before. But anyone who's never seen this before, do you think it's a good idea to do this? <laughs> okay. No, it doesn't really seem like a good idea, because for, for one thing, we've introduced Z. Now, where did Z come from, right? So we've kind of replaced the N, in a sense, with a Z. Yeah, N0 is an initial condition. That's fine. Um, time remains, but we've kind of replaced the N with a Z sort of thing. Yeah, so it's not obvious we've actually made anything any better. But if you know the generating function, you can calculate all kinds of things. So if you know what the generating function is, you can calculate all kinds of things. So let me give you an example. Suppose I wanted to know the extinction probability. So let's suppose I know this function for the, for the process. So, so somehow I plug in the piece here and I get a function. So suppose I wanted to know the probability of extinction by time t, yeah? So the probability of extinction up to time t. Okay, well, how could I get that out of this sum? If I set z, I'm gonna tell you, if I set z equal to, what value would, would be helpful in terms of figuring out what the extinction probability is? So that's the probability that you're at zero, right? Yeah? So how can I pull just the zero value out of this? Okay, I'll show you. So let's write this thing out. So this is P zero N zero Z to the zero plus P one N zero Z to the one plus P two N zero Z squared plus dot dot dot, right? That's all it is. It's just a polynomial like that in Z. So what is z to the zero? Well, it's one, right? So we don't usually write with that, yeah? Okay? Um, so, okay, so what z value should I choose? Yeah, I choose z equals zero, I get this. Yeah, exactly, okay? So this is equal to g of n zero t zero. Hey, that's nice. Okay, all right, so now let's think about it a little bit. Suppose I really wanted to know p1. So the probability that there's one individual. So suppose I really wanted to know this. How could I possibly do that? Fortunately, you said that quietly. Okay, so what trick could I use? Don't say it again. What trick could I use to get this guy? Differentiate with respect to z. Kills this term, gets rid of this, and then, and then set z equal to zero to kill off the higher terms, yeah? Yeah, I said, I differ, just, just to get the first one, all right? Don't go to the general case just yet. Okay, so just to get the first one, I'm gonna differentiate and set z equal to zero. Do we agree that will do the trick? That should do the trick, right? Okay, so this equals dg dz evaluated at z equals zero. Yeah. Make sense? Okay. And you can see now we could calculate, we could get any of the probabilities out of this, right? 
Yeah? So what would the, gen the general formula would be P n n 0 of t would be equal to, okay, so if I want to get the nth one, how many times do I have to differentiate? n times, so I differentiate n times, so d n g d z n, and I set z equal to zero, and I need one more thing. I have to divide, right? Because when I, just looking for example at the second one, if I differentiate twice, I get a two. Yeah, so it has to be one over, what should it be? Something factorial? N factorial? N factorial, okay. So it should be like this. Yeah? So if I know the generating function, I know all the probabilities just by differentiation, um, including the extinction probability, which we often want to know. That's often a useful thing. Yeah, so that's very useful, right? We, all, we, we know that. So the generating function encodes all the probabilities via its derivatives. Yeah? Also, we can get the mean. So I'll show you how we get the mean. So what, remember, what is the mean, the mean number, or the average, well, the mean. So the mean number of cells at time t. The mean number of cells at time t is the sum, so let's call it, I don't know, let's call it n bar. That's equal to the sum of n p sub n n zero, right? Agreed? That's how we average, right? We'd average the probability of each n times that n, yeah? That would be the average. Okay, so how might we, how might we do that? Okay, so we, yeah. Z. Yeah, Z, but yeah, other than that, yeah. So we differentiate with respect to Z because we're not barbarians, okay? And then we set Z equal to one. Okay, let me, so let's have a look. Let's see what, let's see how that works out. Is that okay? Okay, so, so, okay, so differentiate with respect to Z, right? So DG DZ is equal to summation from n equals zero to infinity of n, sorry, 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 uh, the coefficient P n n zero of T, n Z to the n minus one. Agreed by the rules of differentiation, right? We can differentiate the sum, yeah? Um, okay, so I wanted this, so if I set n equals, so if I set z equals to one, I'm done, right? Why do I want to multiply by z? Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. But, um, okay, slow down. Slow down, Dave. Okay, so uh, so we, I, all I'm going to do now is I'm going to set z equal to 1. Okay, can we just let that happen first? Okay, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So that's very useful what you just said, but later on, okay? Okay, so dg dz, so if I set z equals to 1, okay, then I get what I want here, right? Okay, I get what I want. So that's equal to n bar. Okay, make sense? Yeah, so that's, that's the mean. Um, we can also get the variance. So if you want the second moment, okay, so the second moment, you look unhappy. You, ha you okay? You okay? All right. The second moment, which we could then use to get the variance, yeah, the second moment, we would just differentiate twice, okay? And we'd have to mess around a little, okay? To get the second moment, you differentiate twice. Okay, so you can have a look at that. It's not quite that simple. You have to just fool around a little bit with the terms, okay? But you, you can get the second moment, and then that leads to the variance. Yeah. 
Okay. All right. So I think I, well, I hope, I hope I convinced you, if you know the generating function, then you pretty much know everything about the process. Does that sound reasonable? Because you can use it to get any of the probabilities, any of the moments. Yeah? So this is a very helpful thing, right? It's a very helpful thing. Okay, so obviously the problem now becomes how can we compute the generating function, right? So how can we compute the generating function? Yeah, so if we could get it, then it would be a beautiful thing. All right, so fortunately for birth death process, we can get it, okay? But we have to do a bit of math to get that function. But once we have that function, so on the problems, you'll use the function to figure out some stuff, to do some of these calculations, yeah? Okay? So, okay. So here on the slide, I just kind of showed you how you can do what I just did on the board, okay? Um, okay, so the, the challenge now is what we want to do is we want to take the generating function, which is equal to that on the left-hand side, and we want to plug it into here, okay? So we want to figure out how these two things play together. So let's do that now. Um, do you mind if I erase? Can I erase the board? Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. So it's erase. Okay. So let's take my birth death uh, master equation. Okay. Um, okay. So dPm n0 dt equals 2. D times M plus 1, P sub N plus 1, N0. Um, I'm going to suppress writing the T's just to save a little space. Okay. Um, now let's just focus on this. Okay. And then there's going to be another term below. So it's plus B N minus 1. P n minus one and zero um, minus d plus b and p n and zero. Okay, so we have something like that. Okay, so now what we do is we multiply by z to the n. Okay, so remember we're trying to make it look like this. So we're going to multiply this whole equation by z to the n, and then we're going to sum the whole equation. And that's going to give us something with the generating function. So I multiply by z to the n here, and I sum, okay? And I multiply z to the n and sum, z to the n, sum, z to the n, sum. Okay? All right? So now, make sense? So now this guy looks like a generating function, right? So this is the derivative with respect to t of this guy. So if I differentiate this with respect to t, I will get this, yeah? So my equation is um, d g d t, right? So d g d t on the left side, yeah? Agreed? Yeah, this is the derivative with respect to t of this guy. Yeah? So d g d t, Excuse me. Uh, okay. And now I have stuff. And some of it looks like a generating function and some of it doesn't. Agreed? Yeah, so here I have an n plus 1 multiplying. Right? So the, the d here would be fine. Yeah? So d times 1. So then I've got d times my generating function. But I've also got an n here, which is a little different. How, uh, uh, so, and it's also, this is pn plus 1. So it's a little different, yeah? So the, the challenge becomes, how could I rewrite these terms with n's and n plus 1's and things into the proper form, yeah? So I can get everything in terms of g, okay? Now, I, I left this up here. Oh, I didn't have the, the formula, okay? This is the formula that you're going to use. Because when you take the generating function and differentiate with respect to z, so before we set z equal to 0, or equal to 1, rather, before we set z equal to 1, 
we had it like this, okay? All right, now, if I multiply through by z, as you were trying to make me do before, yeah, if I multiply by z, yeah, then I get like this. Yeah, is that helpful? Yeah, this is actually kind of helpful, right? Because we can see terms which have a look of this showing up here, like this guy. You see that? We have a... We have that, that term showing up like that, okay? Now what about these guys here, where we have n plus one? What we do is we shift the sum. We shift the summation, okay? So, um, you have to be a little bit careful about doing this. So, g, so g of z, so g, g is equal to the summation of p, n, n zero, uh, times z to the n, okay? And that's the sum from n equals zero to infinity. So, for example, if I write m equals to n plus one, I can move the summation here, right? Uh, maybe I should make it, um, yeah, m equals n plus one. So then this would be g equals to the sum Okay, so n equals m minus 1. All right, so the summation goes from m equals 1 to infinity. Okay, and then I have p m minus 1 n0 z to the m minus 1. Okay, so I, ha I can resum the summation like that just to shift it. And now you'll see I have p, this looks, this guy, yeah, this guy here has a strong similarity with this guy. Okay, especially if I multiply through by z. So zg would be equal to, I can make it even closer to this guy. Yeah? Okay, so by, I, I'm not going to say it's easy, okay, but you can do it. It's just a question of being careful with your algebra. So by using tricks, such as differentiating with respect to z and multiplying by z, or by resumming and maybe multiplying by z as needed, you can reorganize these terms into something very compact, okay? Which I have on the next slide to show you because I don't actually remember what it is, okay? So you can, you can reorganize the terms by doing some algebra, okay, into, okay, into two question marks, but when you do it, you get this very compact expression, okay? All right, so this is what you get. You get dg dt is equal to, uh, yeah, bz squared, bz squared minus b plus dz plus d times dg dz. Okay. All right. So, We've rewritten everything into one equation. The only problem is it's a PDE, and who knows how to solve it? Anybody solve it? Can you solve it? Who would know how to solve that? Sorry? I, I can't understand. Sorry. Separation, separation of variables. Yeah, it doesn't go. It doesn't exactly go that way. It goes by method of characteristics. Yeah. Because no, I wouldn't use Fourier transform. You only do method method of characteristics on this fellow. Yeah. It's a first order PDE, first order in space and time, if you like, if Z is space. And um, the method. I'm not going to teach the method because that would take two hours minimum, possibly three. Okay. But there's a method which is in books. And you can go and you can read and you can find this method called method of characteristics to solve this guy, okay? All right? I, I know that's a tiny bit unsatisfying, but, you know, <laughs> I can't, we don't have time to do everything, right? Okay? So if you go to a PDE book, an elementary um, uh, PDE book, I'm trying to remember the name of the one we use. Anyway, if you find any, pretty much any book on which has a decent chunk on partial differential equations, it'll have a thing, a whole chapter on method of characteristics, and you'll be able to solve. 
Okay. All right. So, so you can solve it using method of characteristics. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's not the one that. Yeah. Yeah. It, this is this is like first year of graduate level math kind of thing that you learn how to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's just say that we can solve this. Okay. <laughs> Without worrying about going through all the details of solving it. Okay. So then. Oh. Okay. So we can solve it by method of characteristics. Okay. All right. So that. That was the forward equation, okay? So what we did, let's just, go, let's just go back and refresh as to what we did. If we go back, we took, we took up to t, and then we said what can happen by t plus delta t, and then we figured out this equation, and then we plugged the generating function into this equation, and we derive this PDE and then I just tell you, you can solve it by method of characteristics, okay? And you're all happy. Okay, so there's an alternative way of deriving a differential equation, not this one, a different differential equation for the probabilities. And it's called the backward method, and it has certain advantages. The main advantage is you don't get a PDE. You get an ODE, okay? So I'm gonna show you how to use the backward equation to get an ODE, and that might be easier to solve, right? So we're gonna do that, okay? All right. Okay, so here's the backward formulation. So with the backward formulation, you still get to t plus delta t. This is going to seem really weird. Except you do your delta t at the beginning. Okay? And then you jump forward by t. Okay, so you still end up in the same place, but you do the delta t in the beginning. And because the delta t is in the beginning, it affects the initial conditions, okay? So it's as if, okay, so let me show you the first term here. How can, how can you get to n at time t plus delta t? Okay, so what is the probability of being at n at time t plus delta t, okay? All right, so let's suppose you started at the initial point with one extra cell, right? With one extra cell, sorry, that's not right. That's not the right way of thinking about it. Cancel that. <laughs> I haven't explained this for a while. Okay. Suppose you started off with n zero cells, yeah, and then, hold on, how does this work? Uh, can somebody explain this? I know this is right. I just have to be able to explain it. Okay, so you start off. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, okay. So, so the, way to, the way to interpret this first bit, okay? This is what happens when you have N0 plus one cells here, okay? So you, you started at N0, this N0. You started off with N0 cells, and you had a birth in this period, okay? So now you have n0 plus 1. So what's the probability you get to n after time t? Yeah, Because you had your delta t, and now you have to go from n plus 1, like your initial condition, this number, to n yeah, over that length of time, which is time t. OK? So, so b n0 delta t, yeah? That's the rate of births during the first delta t. We started with n0, we have a birth rate of b, we have time delta t, yeah? So this is that a birth happened. So the probability a birth happened during delta t times the probability that you go now from your initial condition, which is now one bigger, because you had a birth in that first delta t, to n over the remaining t. It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> Especially when it takes me a second to explain it. But does it make sense? Yeah? So effectively, what's happening is in, if in the first delta t you had a birth, that would basically be changing the initial condition. Right? So you, you started with n0, but then you had a birth before delta t. Yeah? And then from in, in, from in the remaining t of time, in this remaining amount of time, you went from n0 plus 1 to n. 
Yeah? Does that make sense? So there would be many ways of that happening. You know, one way would just be to have one death, but you know, there are other things. You could have two births and three deaths or something. Yeah. Okay, so you guys do not look so happy about that. So, yeah. Okay, can I get to that in a minute? I'm going to explain every term in the hope that it will get through, right? Because this is, so, so I explained the birth part, right? So now again, focusing here, right? We started off at N0. We had a death, okay? A death before delta T, okay? So now it's like we have an initial condition of N0 minus one, yeah? And we have to get to N, yeah? Because N is, N is where we're aiming for, right? Yeah? So it's like there was a death in the beginning part. These, these brackets should not be here, but anyway. There was a death in the first part, that's that thing. And then you get to, it's like you changed your initial condition, but you still end up at n. Yeah. Okay, now this is, you started off at n0, and you did not, nothing happened. So, that, so we have all three cases, right? There was a birth in the first delta t, there was a death in the first delta t, and nothing happened in the first delta t. And if nothing happened, this is all the, this is what's left. This is no birth, no death, no birth, yeah? then you still have to start at N0 and get to N. Yeah? So this is called the backward formulation because the delta T is happening in the beginning of time. But either way you do it, you put the delta T at the end or at the beginning, yeah? you still have, you still get to T plus delta T. Yeah? So this is how this works. So now we subtract this guy, this P sub N, N0, over to the left-hand side, divide by delta T, and we get a derivative looking thing, yeah, and these equations here, okay? All right, and so when I take the limit of this guy, you can see that I again have an infinite system of differential equations, yeah? I get an infinite system of ODEs here, yeah? Okay, but this is, this is called the backward chapman coleman graph or master equation. Okay, and you can see that it's a different equation than the forward master equation. Does that make sense? It's different, right? It looks differently. For one thing, all the variability seems to be in N0, in the N0 rather than in the N. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's almost like you're changing your initial conditions. So you sort of how you're thinking about it. Okay, so you got this equation. This guy is just a derivative. We take the limit. This is a derivative, yeah. Okay. So what about when we put the generating function into the backward equation, yeah? So over there I have the process where I multiplied by z to the n on the forward equation, and then I summed, yeah? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to multiply by z to the n and sum on the backward equation. Okay, so do you guys trust me? You probably should, but it, that's the backward equation up there, okay? Oh no, sorry, that's the backward equation, that's the generating function. Here, I multiply by z to the n and I sum, and then I do tricks of this nature, okay, to find my way to, um, This, this infinite system of differential equations, okay? So, do you see, do you see it's an infinite system? How, what, what's the thing could, that could be any possible value? The n0, right? The n0, for each possible n0, I've got a differential equation here for g, okay? All right, so I'm just gonna write the backward equation, yes? Yes? Uh, yeah, but just because I'm writing partial, it's still just a derivative. There's only, well, I'm only differentiating with respect to t here. There's no d by dz's, right? Yeah, that, that was just how I wrote it. That's not, that's not so, the, the question was, why, is I, why am I writing partials? I think it's because when I was writing the LaTeX, I just was writing partials, so I just kept doing it, okay? Yeah, that's not, that's not so important. Yeah, so here's my, here's my backward equation, so dg, Okay, I'll write it the correct way this time, okay? So D, G, 
dt is equal to. I mean, I guess, I guess it's still technically a partial, right? Up where? Yeah, that, but it's, it's a function of several variables, and I'm only differentiating with respect to one of them. But nothing else depends on t. I, I, yeah, you're right. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's not, it's not important. Yeah. Okay. So d, dg dt equals bn0. Um, sorry. Okay, how, how about we'll compromise, okay? The top one can be a D, the bottom one can be a partial, okay? All right, then we, we reach a compromise, okay? All right, so um, <laughs> B N0, <laughs> don't ever do that, okay? G of N0 plus one. Right. So this is DG of N0. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna suppress the T and the Z just for simplicity, plus D N0, G of N0 minus one. Uh, minus um, b plus d n zero uh, g oh, that's zero. Okay, so I'm just I just didn't write the t's and the z's. Okay. Okay. So this is an infinite system of differential equations. For the, for the generating function. So it might seem like we, nothing happened, right? So with the forward problem, we introduced the generating function, and we went from the forward equation to a single PDE. With the backward equation, we introduced the generating function, and we went to an infinite system of ODE. So nothing got better, right? We're still in the same place. We still have infinitely many equations to solve. Yeah. But there's one thing that we can do now, which is very nice and elegant, okay? So I'll now show you this, there's one little trick we can do. And basically, the point is, is if you're starting off with N zero cells, so you have, you know, one, two, three, four, up to N zero, this is your initial condition, then each one of those is independent. So each one of them has its own um, family tree. Yeah? Each one of them produces new births and deaths and things, independently of all the rest. So having N0 at the beginning is basically the same as having one thing, except N0 times. Okay? So there's a trick we can pull with the generating function, which I'll show you on the next slide, which is, allows us to reduce this to a single ODE. Okay? So we're going to do that. Okay, so. So if we assume that lineages, so lineage, do you know this word lineage? It means the descendants of a single individual. So you have one cell here, he has his descendants, the next cell will have his, and we call this, this is one lineage, this is another lineage, so forth, okay? So this is all the descendants of one cell. So if we can assume that they're identical, so they're all the same, they all follow the same rules, that doesn't mean they have the same process, it just means they follow the same stochastic rules, yeah? and they're all independent, and we get this big simplification, and I'll show you it. Okay, so, the first thing is, do you agree with that? That the generating function is actually the expected value of z to the n naught. So, sorry, z to the n, on the side. Yeah. That's right, yeah? That's how we take expectations, right? So if you were just averaging, it's just the expectation of n, yeah? But this could, we could equally well take the expectation of z to the n. So the average value of z to the n is the generating function. We don't usually think of it that way, but it's true. This is, this is the case. Okay, so the, the expected value of z to the n at time t is equal to that. Now, if I think of the n's as all the lineages, yeah? So we have n0 lineages. We started off with n0 cells, yeah? So we started off with a cell here, and a cell here, and a cell here, up to the n zero cell. Yeah? And this cell did this, you know, and then this one died, and this one had a descendant, and then this one had two descendants, you know, or something like this, right? This is this lineage, yeah? So there's this branching process going on here for birth death, right? And the same for this guy. Let's just say this one ended, and this one, this one did a little better, and, and so on, yeah? But they're all independent of each other. This, this lineage does not talk to this one, right? 
So if we call this lineage, it's L1, and this lineage is L2, and this lineage is L3, yeah? Then what I mean here is that the N cells which are alive, so these N cells here, which are alive after some time, yeah? It's made up of the con contributions from each of the lineages, yeah? So here it's taking two cells from lineage one, and three cells from lineage three, and so on and so forth, up to N zero, yeah? So we have the sums of each of the lineages. Yeah, the, so the number of cells that's alive is the sum of all the cells from each lineage. Good? It's, it's a weird notation. Okay, but... Okay, so now we can... Now we can say each lineage is independent, right? So the expected value of the e to the sums of these things should be the expected value of this lineage, the expected value of that lineage, and you mul just multiply them together, right? Because we're summing here in the exponent, so we should be multiplying. But then when you multiply, you realize that actually um, they're all independent, yeah? So when you have a multiplicative uh, set of things and you take the expectation, yeah, that's just you individually take you just multiply the expectations. If you've not done probability, you're not going to get this. <laughs> but, but this is the idea, right? If you have independent objects, they're, and they're, then, then you can break them apart if they're multiplicative. OK? We good, Sunny? I think we're good, right? Yeah. All right. And now, somebody tell me something about each expectation here. What do I know about these? Say it louder. They're all the same, yeah. Yeah? There's nothing special about L1 or L2. They're all exactly the same. Yeah? The expected value for each lineage should be the same. So basically, I've just got N0 copies of the same thing here. Okay? So collapse this product down to this. Yeah? And so it's the expectation of Z to any lineage, yeah, to the N0. Okay? And we already said the expectation of Z to the L, right? Yeah. But this, so, so for any lineage, there's only one cell at the beginning. Yeah. For, for, if you just have one lineage, there's one cell at the beginning. So N0 equals to 1 here. But we have N0 copies of it. Yeah. So this, this should really be basically just one lineage. Yeah. So it's this. Okay. So we set N0 equal to 1, because for a single lineage, there's one precursor cell. T and Z, N0, okay? Now this is kind of cool, right? Because this is telling me a formula for my generating function with N0 cells at the beginning is just the N0th power of one cell at the beginning. Okay. So this, this is the bottom line. <laughs> if you don't follow all of that, you still, you get this, okay? So basically, if you have N0 cells at the beginning, because they're all independent and identical, that's the same as having a power of N0 with one cell at the beginning. Okay? And this gives you a big simplification, because I can rewrite all of these Gs with N0, so this guy, and this guy, and this guy, using this formula, right? So let's do that. Let's, let's rewrite that formula using this identity here. Okay, so let's see, even write it here for convenience. G of N0, T and Z is equal to G of 1, T and Z to the N0. Okay, now let's try to apply this. Okay, so the first thing I have to do is differentiate with respect to T. So I have to differentiate this guy with respect to T. So I have to apply the chain rule, yeah? So I get N0 um, um, what am I doing? N0 G of 1 T Z to the power of N0 minus 1 times the derivative of g of 1 tz, yeah? Times d by dt of g 
of 1 Tz. Yeah? So that's, that's just differentiating this guy. Yeah? Okay, so that's equal to B N0 G of 1 Tz to the power of N0 plus 1. That's that term, right? Just rewriting G of N0 plus 1 as G of 1 to the N0 plus 1. Okay? I've got a D here, so I've got plus almost the same thing, plus D N0 G of 1 Tz to the N0 minus 1. And then finally, this term, minus B plus D N0 um, G of 1 Tz to the N0. Good. Okay, and now it will be good to probably multiply through by g of 1 tz to the n0, oh, sorry, divide by g of 1 tz to the n0 minus 1, right? Okay, so I'll let you have a second to finish copying that if you want to copy it. Yeah, we good? Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to use the magic of blackboards to divide. The magic of blackboards is I can just erase stuff, okay? So I'm going to divide by g of 1 tz to the n0 minus 1, okay? So I'm going to divide that term out of here. Everybody watch carefully what I'm doing, okay? There's nothing up my sleeve here, so that goes away. Okay, hold on. Do some patience, okay? Patience, all right? So you divide by n0 minus 1. That n0 turns into a 1. That n0 plus 1 turns into a 2. Okay, and this guy goes away. Okay. And then, and then Mr. Mr. Das, right, said that I can divide by n0, right? So I divide by n0. Okay, and in the end, I have this equation, which looks a bit of a mess right now, but I'll copy it more tidy. So dg dt, so dg 1 tz dt equals to b times g of 1 tz squared plus uh, minus b plus d g of 1 tz plus d. Now that is a single, different, a single ordinary differential equation. Is it linear or nonlinear? It's nonlinear. So how do we solve it? How do we solve it? Anybody know? Sorry? Can you say that again? Sorry. No, I can't understand either. Sorry. <laughs> Separation of variables. Yeah. Uh, can you separate variables on that guy? Sorry. Completing squares. Um, that might work. I I know this is a Riccati equation. Have you ever heard of Riccati equations? Um, so there's a technique for solving Riccati equations. But again, I don't want to go into it. I don't think that you can separate variables. If you complete the square, yeah, okay. If you can do it, show me, okay? All right, if it works, show me, okay. All right, so anyway, basically boil everything down to this single equation, okay? We boil everything down to this single equation. And if we can solve that single equation, which we can, because it's a Riccati equation, we get the solution, okay? All right. So, as I say in my slide, it's a Riccati equation. Look it up. Okay, if you, Google, if you, if you look on the Wikipedia page for Riccati equation, it'll tell you how to solve it. Okay. Is it free online? Yeah, what's the name of the book? Who's the author? Oh. 
Yeah, so it's, that's great, Samit, thank you. So he recommends uh, uh, Snedden's book on, uh, on differential equations. And, yeah, and it will have Riccati, right? Yeah, okay. It, it, has, it should have, hopefully, separation of variables and Riccati equation, which either, you have to do one or the other to solve the, the problem, okay? So if you solve the Riccati equation for G1, you get this. Right? Okay, so it's a bit of a mess. And it has a lot of features of this sigma function. This sigma is e to the b minus dt. That's the um, average solution, right? That's the, the differential equation solution corresponding to the probabilistic model. Yeah. So you can see sigma shows up in many places. Okay? And the birth rate and the death rate, and it's a function of z. And you just have to trust me, but if you do method of characteristics, you get the exact same thing, okay? So it works exactly the same, All right, which is good, right? This is good. Okay. okay, so this was a lot of work, right? So we do a lot of work, and we get the generating function. But now, as I showed you at the beginning, we have the generating function, so now we can do everything, right? Yeah? You remember I showed you, you can get the mean, you can get the variance, you can get the extinction probability, you can get any of the probabilities of any n value you want. You just have to differentiate this guy n times, right? Yeah? So now we have the problem is completely solved, actually. Yeah? Problem is completely solved. So I'm surprised you guys aren't happier. We completely solved the problem. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So let's just do a little bit of interpretation of this, okay? Um, to, see, to see what's going on, okay? Okay, so I rewrote the formula up here. Okay, so let's just look at some cases. So if B is bigger than D, so if the birth rate is bigger than the death rate, right, then sigma goes to infinity, yeah? So if B exceeds D, then sigma will go to infinity, yeah, as time goes to infinity. So it, as time progresses, yeah? As time progresses, we can calculate the extinction probability yeah, at, for, at infinite time. Yeah? So let me, let me explain what I mean by that. So let's calculate the extinction probability at infinite time from this. Okay? So let's just say p extinction is equal to the limit as t goes to infinity of p that we started at n0 and we got to, um, to, uh, to 0. Yeah? So we'll, we'll say that the extinction probability is equal to that. Okay, so it's the, it's, the, it's the eventual extinction probability, yeah? After infinite long time. So p extinction is equal to this. So that's equal to the limit as t goes to infinity of g as I showed you before, right? G of um, N0, T, and um, 0, right? So we set Z equal to 0. That gives me the extinction probability. Okay. Uh, the, the generating function I have written up there is for 1. So let's just set N0 equal to 1, yeah? So let's just set N0 equal to 1. Okay, and we'll worry about the other cases later on, okay? So with one, with one. Okay, so as I take t goes to infinity, so as t goes to infinity, okay, sigma goes to infinity in this formula, yeah? Okay, so what's going to happen as, oh yeah, and I get to set z equal to zero, right? And remember I have z equals zero, Okay, so let's just look at that. This is the limit as t goes to infinity. Setting, setting z equal to zero, I get sigma of t minus one. The z is equal to zero, so that goes away. Divided by b over d of b over d times sigma of t minus one. And the z is zero, yeah? So this is the extinction probability. 
take the limit as t goes to infinity with b greater than d. Birth rate is bigger than death rate. So what happens? What's the limit of this? d divided by b, right? d divided by b. Notice, it's not zero. Yeah? In the stochastic model, even though the birth rate is greater than the death rate, you can still go extinct. Yeah? You can still go extinct. Okay. okay. Um, on the other hand, oh, here's a typo. That's a typo, right? I mean the other way around. If b is less than d, so if b is less than d, okay, then the same, the same formula holds, yeah, but p extinction, okay, so this time sigma goes to zero. So what does p extinction equal? One. So if the death rate is greater than the birth rate, it could be that the population is around for a while, but ultimately they just end up being sucked back to, to being all dead. Yeah? It's impossible to escape, right? Okay. And we can also calculate any, any other properties that, that we want to, any, any other p's that we want to, that we want to calculate. So, I showed you this plot yesterday. And this was with the birth rate B equals 3, and the death rate D equals 2. And I did a thousand simulations with Gillespie, and I found that two-thirds of them were extinct. Correct? So my simulation was working correctly, right? Yeah, so this is good. Yeah. Okay. Um, we can also calculate the mean. Okay, so we're starting from here. We can calculate the mean by taking the derivative of g and setting z equal to 1, like we did before, right? Like I showed you over there. So we can calculate the mean, and you do some algebra, it's different, you have to differentiate this, so you have to do some algebra and differentiate, and you can end up calculating the mean. Okay? All right. Um, you can also calculate the variance. Okay, so basically, we can differentiate two times, get something which is starting to look like the second moment, and then you can calculate the variance from that, because you know the mean, you know, you'll, you'll get the second moment. Okay? And the, this is the variance of the process here. Okay. Do you remember on the, the computer assignment yesterday I asked you for the variance of something? That was the variance of the extinction time. It's a little different than this, but you kind of get the idea. Okay. All right. How's everybody feeling? That was a good hour, right? That was a good hour. How are you doing? I have one more thing I wanted to tell you. Everybody stretch. Everybody stretch. Yeah. Okay. We did a lot. Yeah, that's actually a lot to this morning, okay? Um, I, there's one more thing I want to show you, and then we have some problems to do, okay? Anyone have any questions up to this point? Who, who, who thinks that, yeah, go ahead. You mean the PDE? Yeah, it's the same G. It's the same G. So I solved it by Riccati, right? Riccati's equation. But with the, um, if you solve the PDE, you get the same answer. There's no difference, okay? You get the same answer. And in fact, do you know method of characteristics? Do you know method of characteristics? No. Well, when you learn it, you can come back and solve this and you'll get the same answer, okay? It's much easier if you think of it as a Riccati equation, though. Okay? Yeah. All right. Um, any, any, yeah? Yes. Yeah, but, 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 so, Okay, so this, yeah, he made a good point. It's always written just with one there. 
If you want n0, you have to just take the power of n0 of this thing, according to this formula. Okay? So that's essential. Yeah, good point, good point. Everyone understand? Yeah? Because this, this is, I'm always writing it with 1, but in fact, if you want n0, you just take the n0 power of the formula. Great question. Any, yes? Can you say that again? Uh, in the second case, where birth rate is less than the death rate. Yes. So, one. So, there is no finite probability that it takes. No, it goes to one. After infinite time. Okay, this is the limit as t goes to infinity. But for a limited amount of time? Yeah, for a limited amount of time. So, if you just imagine I did not take the limit, then for a limited amount of time, the probability is less than one. And you could plot this thing, you know, and it goes. It's like an a S-shaped function. Yeah. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. All right, so I want to show you one more thing. And this is, I know I'm pushing your patience here, okay? So just bear with me. This, this is actually kind of cool, though, okay? So I want to talk about something practical, okay? So... Let's suppose we wanted to figure out how long is the gap between exposure to a disease, say HIV, and a positive test, okay? So when you first get infected, you have just one or two viruses, right? But they multiply according to a birth-death process, perhaps. Let's suppose they have a birth-death process. They're multiplying, right, within your body. And then you have a test, but the test can only detect them when there's enough. So you have to have a, you know, a lot of viruses to get, to, get the, um, to get a positive test. Make sense? The test cannot detect one or two viruses. It has to detect a lot in your blood. Okay? So the question is, what's the gap? How long does it take between becoming infected and detectable infection? Okay? All right. So let's try, just, just graphically, I'll try to show you what I'm thinking of. So graphically... So graphically, this is the viral load, this is time, okay? And you're starting off here, okay? And the limit of detection is here, okay? So you have to reach that line before you're detected. Okay, so let's think about what happens. A virus infects a cell, a cell makes viruses. Those infect cells, those make viruses. So it's kind of like a birth-death process, right? Some of the viruses will die in between when they're produced, they will die before they find a new cell, right? Yeah? And some of them will not. That's just how it is. Okay? So we start off down here. So what do you think will happen? Yeah? Can we agree that it should be some sort of path like this? Okay, so now what we want to know is we want to know how long is this time, right? So we want to know this. Yeah? Now probably sometimes it goes extinct. And we don't know that because we know, we can, there's no way we can ever visualize that event, right? That somebody actually was transiently infected with HIV. We don't know if that happens or not. Yeah. Okay. But you can imagine some sort of process where it gets to. So we want to know actually how long is this? So then if somebody does something risky and then goes to their doctor and says, I did something risky, I'm worried, the doctor may have some idea, okay, if, we, if I give you a test, suppose this is 10 days, or two weeks, or three weeks. I give you a test in two or three weeks that I know, and it's negative, then you're safe. Yeah? You would want to know that, right? Okay. So the people have estimated this, and the estimates have always between, been between one week and two weeks, three weeks, something like that, for the blood tests. Okay? For antibody tests, it takes longer. Okay. But suppose we really want to know what this gap is. So we, we decided we wanted to know that, and we decided we were going to use um, birth-death processes to get there. Okay? Because we like birth-death process much better than exponential growth process, and that's the only choice. Okay. Oh, yeah. And so you might think you could do this experimentally. So with people, the problem is, is people rarely get infected, so it's very hard for people to know that they got infected or not, yeah, to even have any idea. Okay? So there's very few case studies in the literature where, okay, I did something bad on Saturday and I was infected two weeks later. This doesn't, doesn't really happen. Animal experiments are really hard to interpret. For one thing, they're animals, not people. And for another thing, the people with the animals are very, very expensive to keep. So if you're going to in infect a 
monkey with a SIV or a, a, a simianized uh, HIV, then you typically make sure they get infected by giving them a massive dose. Because if you give them just a little bit and they don't get infected, it wastes some time. So most of the experiments where they infect monkeys, they give them a big dose to make sure they get infected. Also, if they give them a slightly too low dose and they don't get infected, and then they do it again a few weeks later, and a few weeks later, they start to worry, if they can't be infected, they start to worry that the monkey has become immune, that they've vaccinated the monkey. So they're always a little bit worried about these things. Now, they've never, they can't vaccinate the monkeys, but nonetheless. Okay, uh, and it's also difficult to find patients who just got infected. It's actually practically just difficult to find people in that state. Okay, okay. so, so we, the, the, these were the problems we were looking at. Okay, so what the data we had was uh, in the United States, it's quite common for people uh, in um, low-income people to sell plasma. So they go to a kind of a center and they sit for a half an hour and they take out some blood and they give them the red cells back, but they just take the plasma, okay, the, 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 the liquid that the red cells are in, okay? Um, and occasionally these plasma donors become HIV positive, okay? And then the plasma centers de detect the HIV in the plasma so what they do is they actually don't release the plasma instantly to the hospitals. They keep the plasma for, a f and, and as the people keep coming back, if they become HIV positive, then they, then they don't use that plasma in the hospitals, even for like a month or two months before, okay? So what you have is p these dots are when the people came in and gave plasma, and these are the HIV test results from those, from those um, samples. Okay, so this guy came in four times with, and there was no HIV found in his blood. And then on the fifth time, he had a detectable viral load. Okay, does that make sense? So th this, is, this is the experiment we, we have. Um, this one, well, the first time he showed up, he was undetectable. The second time he had a detectable viral load. Yeah? So none of this plasma can be used, obviously, in the hospitals. But it's very, use it's very interesting from our point of view because we can use it to understand something about early viruses. Okay, you can see. So you can see that they must not test very frequently, right? Because this guy was positive for a long time before, um, before they realized that he had age. They went back and, uh, and got through it out. Yeah. No, no, this is, this is the virus dynamics model. This is what it does. It goes up and it comes down again. This is the oscillation, so it, it, it hits a peak and it comes back down. So this guy is actually heading towards the set point. Yeah, you know, this is one little bit of noisy data. So we have about 100 of these. There's about 100 data sets like this. So what we decided to do, basically we're gonna run a birth-death process back in time so that the average of the birth-death process matches this slope here. Okay, because it should be exponential growth, right? Yeah, so the average would be exponential growth. Can anybody see what I'm doing wrong though? So if I, if I take this data here and I fit an exponential function back through those two points, the, 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 through these, this point and this point, say, yeah, what am I doing wrong? There's something about this data which means that just treating it as a representation of a birth-death process is the not the right thing to do. Yeah, that, that, would, that would be what I'm kind of saying is a, like a thought experiment, right? Uh, uh, well, yeah, I guess I'm treating the virus like a cell. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of being a little loose around that. That's a good point, yeah. There's, there's something about data like this, though. What, what does every patient here have in common? They all ended up HIV positive. So over on that little chalk plot I made, which patients do we not see here? The ones that went extinct. So this data set is actually biased. Like as a way of looking at a birth-death process, these data are actually biased in the sense that we don't see the ones that went extinct. We only see the people that went positive, right? So I just want to quickly, this is what I wanted to show you, because it's kind of interesting, is you can do the whole, all this stuff that I just did, 
that you can condition, you can do a condition model and condition that the virus does not go extinct. Okay? So it's kind of tricky. Okay, so if you define Q to be the probability that the birth death process goes extinct, and then we apply Bayes rule. You know Bayes rule? Bayes rule? Okay, well, okay, well, you can look it up. Yeah, <laughs> you apply Bayes rule. You can basically find the conditional probability that your, your birth death process, that n of t is the probability that n of t equals n, given that n of infinity is not zero. So, in other words, it doesn't go extinct. Okay, so assuming that we have no extinction in infinite time. Okay, and you can apply Bayes rule and you can get this formula here. So the probability here, so it's 1 over 1 minus the, uh, the extinction probability to the power of the initial number of viruses. We have to estimate that. That's messy, but let's worry about that. Okay, so it's the times the P for the whole process minus the P times Q to the N. Okay, and this is just how it works out. And then if you plug in your generating function into that. So you take this and you figure out what the generating function should be for this guy. So this is a probability, so we can make a generating function for this guy. We call it condition generating function. The condition generating function is equal to the original generating function minus the original generating function where instead of just z, we put qz, and q is the probability of extinction. And then there's a correction for, for the extinction down here as well. So we can actually get the generating function for the condition process. So you just have to trust me on that part a little bit, because I'm not I don't want to go through all the details of Bayes' rule and so forth, because we're a little bit low on time. Okay. And then you can calculate the mean of the condition process just by differentiating that generating function with respect to z, setting z equal to one. And the conditioned process, so if, if it doesn't go extinct, the mean looks like this. Okay? So the mean has a curve in it. All right? If it, do, if it can go extinct, the mean is just a straight line. This is on a log plot, by the way. Yeah, do you notice this is a log axis? Yeah. So on a log plot, if it's unconditioned, the mean is a straight line. So let's just think about what the mean means. The mean is the average of all the ones that have gone to infinity or are climbing and all the zeros, right? All the extinct ones. If you condition, you remove all the extinct ones and you're just taking the average of the ones that grow. Yeah? So it makes sense, actually, that these, guys, that, that these ones should be bigger, for one thing, because they didn't go extinct. This is the average including all the ones that are down here on zero, right? So it's lower. And secondly, how would you avoid going extinct? What's the most efficient way to not go extinct? You have to get away from zero as quick as possible. Because as, as, if you're a process, yeah, and you don't want to go extinct, you don't want to be hanging around near zero, because there's always that risk of going extinct, yeah? So the condition process gets away from zero as quick as it can, a lot faster than the average, yeah? Because a lot of the average ones go extinct, right? Yeah. Okay, so what we do is we fit the data, so the data would be a sort of a point here and a point here, and we fit the data and we estimate back like that to the time of infection, okay? And um, at some point later on today, I'll show you some of those results, okay? But for now, I would like to stop. Now, does anyone have any questions? Uh, it, it could be any units. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll actually show you uh, conclusions on the HIV infection time after the break. Well, uh, it, at the end of the part after the break. Okay. All right. Okay. So I just want to summarize what we did in the last hour and a half or hour and a quarter. Um, we learned the generating function. We plugged the generating function into the forward equation from yesterday. We got a PDE for the generating function. We said method of characteristics. Yeah? Then I derived the backward equation, which you guys were not too happy about. Okay? So you derive the backward equation. We plug the generating function into the backward equation, get and, and do something about independence and identical lineages, and we got a single ODE. 
for the backward equation, for the uh, generating function, which I said is a Riccati equation, and you all nodded. Oh, yeah, Riccati equation. Yes, I know that. Um, and I told you what the solution was. Yeah? Okay? And then I showed that you can calculate the mean and the variance of the birth-death process. Yeah? And that we sort of know everything because we have the generating function. And then, even though I knew I was pushing it, and possibly everyone's exhausted, I said, you can condition the process on non-extinction. And you can find a different mean and actually different variance, all kinds of different stuff, if you condition. Because if you're a branching process, you, if you want to stay alive, you better get away from zero. So the average goes away from zero much faster than, on a, than normal if it's conditioned for non-extinction. Yeah. That's what we did. How do you feel about all that? Okay, I got a thumbs up from over there. Okay. All right. And the, the terminology of saying condition for non extinction is just a statement that when the data you fit is the success, the five, five, four, nine, six. That would be the right way of thinking about it, yeah. Yeah. So if you think about it, just about any, if you think about branching processes in ecology, so think about pandas and other things that are like pandas. Everything we measure is actually conditioned on non-extinction because if the animal is extinct, we can't measure it anymore. <laughs> Every, yeah. Everything is biased because we only have to study species that exist. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. But just flipping this around, yeah. If you if you, imagine you have a species that you're worried about going extinct, right? Yeah. Um, we saw yesterday in the exercises that um, the, if you use an ODE model it looks like it will stay alive for a lot longer than it really does. So in that latent cell model you did yesterday afternoon, right, the mean time to extinction from the branching process that you simulated was much shorter than for the exponential decay. And this is actually very important. If, if somebody ever asks you how long is the spotted woodpecker going to be alive, or some, you know, animal, and you have time series, you should never fit an exponential through it. You should always think about it in terms of um, a, um, a stochastic model. Could it be that if you're, someone was asking this about a, a population that's currently very large and so not necessarily considered endangered, that you were to show with some means that... Uh, that it was going down, was yeah. That it was going down. If the numbers are large enough, mm -hmm. then... Maybe. Yeah, if the numbers are big, the, the two models are indistinguishable. Look, if you look at... Uh, this is on a log scale, right? If you look at our two virus populations, this one and this, I mean, there's no, there's no difference there. So that's not quite what you asked, but, but the, the slope ends up being the same for the ODE and for the mean of the stochastic process. If you have a large enough population, your stochastic process might as well be an ODE. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we have eight minutes to go. What I'm going to do is pass out the problems, okay, and then... Um, We'll have some time at the, after the tea break to work on the problems, okay? And then you'll be glad to know there are no more problems for today until this afternoon, okay? Uh, so we'll take, I'll, you'll basically just have time to read the problems now, I guess, or maybe do one derivative or something, and then, um, and then it'll be time for tea.